Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Brian Lynn. Anna Mateo and Susan Shand. Later, Katie Weaver and Ashley will bring us the next part in our series on America's national parks. But first, here is Brian Lin. Officials in northern Vietnam have ordered the closure of four industrial parks because of an outbreak of COVID 19. The parks in the province of Bac Zan are to remain closed until the situation improves. We hope the measure will be in place for just two weeks, but it depends on the situation of the outbreak, local official Lei Eng Zung told Reuters. Three of the parks house production centers for Taiwan based electronics company Foxconn, which manufactures iPhones and other products for Apple. Foxconn confirmed its operations in the province had been suspended and said it was cooperating with local officials on the latest virus fighting measures. Bakzan, which sits about 60 kilometers northeast of Hanoi, has been experiencing a new outbreak of COVID 19 that began in late April. Factory workers were among those infected. The province has recorded more than 400 infections since April 27. That number was about one third of all of the country's COVID 19 cases over the same period, the Ministry of Health said. Local officials and companies operating in the area of the parks will together establish a new way to prevent the virus spreading inside the factories, Le Eng Zhuang said. We have no choice but to live with the virus. In January, Vietnam gave approval to a Foxconn owned company to build a $270 million factory to produce computers and tablets. Reuters reported last year that Foxconn had decided to move some iPad and MacBook production to Vietnam from China at the request of Apple. The report said Apple's decision was linked to ongoing trade tension between China and the United States. Foxconn said its other factories in Vietnam were still running. However, operations at those centers could also be changed if further virus prevention measures are ordered, it added. Vietnam's VN Express website reported that officials in Ho Chi Minh City in the south have begun carrying out mass testing of workers in that area's industrial production centers. Additional antivirus measures were also ordered in an effort to prevent new outbreaks, the officials said. Hua Quoc Hong heads the local organization in charge of Ho Chi Minh City's industrial production centers. He told VN Express the COVID 19 outbreak in the north was troubling because many workers from the south had traveled to other parts of the country during holidays from April 30th to May 3rd. Officials said that since the holiday period, 17,000 workers across the city had been tested for COVID 19. 
I'm Brian Lynn. Federal Services Administration, or GSA, says the United States Coast Guard has decided it no longer needs four of the nation's most beautiful lighthouses. And it is inviting certain types of organizations to take them over at no cost. The GSA is the business and accounting agency of the U.S. federal government. Among other jobs, it manages all federally owned buildings. The GSA has been letting go many of the lighthouses it no longer uses. It is releasing Beaver Tail Lighthouse in Jamestown, Rhode Island. The lighthouse is America's third oldest, and it was present during the American Revolutionary War. The other available lighthouses are Watch Hill Lighthouse, Cleveland Harbor West Pierhead Lighthouse, and Duluth Harbor North Pierhead Lighthouse. Watch Hill Lighthouse is in Westerly, Rhode Island, near the beachside house of American pop star Taylor Swift. The Cleveland Harbor Lighthouse is in Ohio, and Duluth Harbor Lighthouse is in Minnesota. There is a condition: the government said it will make the historic lighthouses and their outbuildings. Available for free to certain groups. They include federal, state, and local government agencies. Additionally, nonprofit organizations or educational and community development agencies may take the buildings. Groups which work with parks, outdoor enjoyment, culture, or historic preservation. May take them as well. Paul Hughes is a spokesperson for GSA. He said the U.S. Coast Guard decided that they no longer needed Beaver Tail Lighthouse. The Coast Guard is part of the Department of Homeland Security. Beaver Tail Lighthouse has been listed in the National Register of Historic Places since 1977. The National Register of Historic Places works to protect historic places and buildings. Beaver Tail Lighthouse is a 19.5 meter high stone lighthouse that faces south, where Narragansett Bay and Rhode Island Sound meet. It offers beautiful views of the ocean. Only the base of the original lighthouse remains. It was built in 1759. It was then burned down by British soldiers, leaving the Newport area in 1779 during the American Revolution. The current lighthouse was built in 1856 with six additional structures, totaling. 480 square meters. Hughes said the government wants groups to express their interest in the next 60 days. The National Park Service will review the applications. Watch Hill Lighthouse is a three-story stone block tower with an iron and glass light on top. It is surrounded by water on three sides. It is attached to a two-story building built in 1935. The outbuildings include an oil house built in 1855 to 1856. The Cleveland Harbor West Pierhead Lighthouse was built in 1911 to guide ships near the port of Cleveland. It housed a Coast Guard station. Until 1976, it is best known for its yearly change into a beautiful ice tower when winter temperatures freeze lake water onto the building. A sister lighthouse 
Cleveland Harbor East Pierhead Lighthouse was sold a few years ago for $10,000. Duluth Harbor North Pierhead Lighthouse was built in 1910. It is located on the westernmost tip of Lake Superior. It is also listed on the National Register of Historic Places. I'm Ana Mateo. A growing number of U.S. school systems are removing mask requirements for students. But some public health experts and parents are concerned that it is too soon to lift the rules. In Florida, the head of a school system recently announced she would agree to remove a mask requirement that had been in place since September. The decision came after a long, angry fight over mask requirements. But the school board chair in Santa Rosa County, we Ubershar, said she believed the requirement should remain until the end of the school year. Parents shouted insults at her. Communist, Democrat, they said. Moments later, the school board voted to end the mask requirement for all children. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention announced last week that vaccinated Americans do not need to wear masks, but it is still unclear if that is the right decision for children in school. Most children have not yet been vaccinated. The Food and Drug Administration, FDA, recently approved Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine for children as young as 12. It is unlikely, however, that many young children will be vaccinated before the end of the school year. CDC information shows that infection rates among American children ages 14 to 17 are now higher than for all Americans. The rates among children 6 to 13 are also rising. When asked about children wearing masks at school, the CDC director, Dr. Rochelle Walensky, said the agency would soon announce new guidelines for schools, businesses, and other areas. The discussions about school rules have been emotional and highly divisive around the country. In some cases, police were called to meetings. School leaders have been caught between anti-mask parents and teachers' unions. School systems have changed decisions on the issue several times. Many see a continued need to protect children who are not vaccinated against COVID-19. Others argue that masks make children uncomfortable and the requirements limit personal freedom. The mask is a personal choice, and I wore it at the beginning, but I just decided that it wasn't about the mask anymore, said Cynthia Lesharowitz. She is a parent in Milton, Florida, who opposes the requirement. So I decided to take it off, and I wanted my child to have the same choice, she added. The arguments show the state of communities 14 months after the pandemic began to spread in the U.S. Some U.S. schools remain closed to stop infections. Others, from Alabama in the south to Wyoming in the west, decided to end student mask requirements. When the new school year starts in September, many more schools will likely end their requirements. In Arkansas, mask requirements will be illegal at the end of the summer. South Carolina recently ended its mask requirements for students, leaving the decision to individual communities. Many parents in schools where masks are no longer required are worried. I don't see any harm in wearing masks, and there is potential harm in not wearing a mask, said Christy Black. She is the mother of two young school-aged children in Mesa, Arizona. 
she did not understand the decision made by her community's schools to end the requirement. Evidence from earlier in the pandemic found children less likely than older people to be infected with the coronavirus and less likely to become seriously ill from COVID-19. Black continues to send her two children to school with masks, but says they remove the masks as soon as they see other children without them. It just feels like we're more concerned with our own freedom and rights than doing what's best for the most vulnerable, she said. Back in Santa Rosa, Florida, Jennifer Hensley, a Santa Rosa County parent and public school teacher, was the only member of the public at the meeting who spoke in favor of keeping the mask requirement. She said she was worried about the health of teachers and of her 15-year-old daughter who has an autoimmune disease. Another parent, Hailey Smead, a mother of three students, runs a Facebook group called Santa Rosa County Parents Speak Up. It was created in September to stop mask requirements and has nearly 900 registered members. It's not society's job to protect every other individual, Smead said. It's your own job to protect yourself and your family. I strongly recommend the use of face masks, especially for those who are not fully vaccinated, school leader Ubershar said before the vote. She was rewarded with insults from parents. It truly does make me feel sad that face masks have morphed from a virus prevention strategy to a political statement, she said. I'm Susan Shand. Today, we visit a national park that marks one of the most important events in American history. We are exploring the Gettysburg National Military Park in the small town of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Much of the area around Gettysburg still looks like it did in the 1860s during the Civil War. The town is in the middle of farm country. All around are fields of wheat, corn, and other crops. Cows chew on grass under a warm morning sun. Roads that pass through Gettysburg lead to Baltimore, Washington, and other big cities. But years ago, they served another purpose. The roads brought two opposing armies to Gettysburg. One was the United States Army of the Potomac, commanded by General George Gordon Meade. The other was the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia, led by General Robert E. Lee. His troops had moved north into Pennsylvania from Virginia. There, they had won a series of battles. Now, they were on the move to defeat Meade's army. Lee believed that a southern victory on northern land would force a negotiated settlement of the war. This would mean independence for the Confederate states that were attempting to leave the Union. The Battle of Gettysburg began on July 1, 1863. More than 170,000 soldiers fought for three days. It was the largest battle ever fought in North America. When it ended on July 3rd, more than 50,000 soldiers were dead, wounded, or missing. Many more would die later from their wounds. In the end, General Lee's army lost the battle. The Civil War, though,
continued for two more years. But Confederate hopes for independence were never again as high as they had been at Gettysburg. Soon after the Great Battle, people began to visit Gettysburg to try to understand what happened there. One of those visitors, on November 19, 1863, was President Abraham Lincoln. He was invited to help dedicate a ceremony for Union soldiers killed in the battle. Lincoln spoke for just two minutes. His speech began this way. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. President Lincoln had never been satisfied with the reality of American life at that time. The Declaration of Independence in 1776 had declared all men equal. Yet in the South, and earlier in the North as well, black men and women were held as slaves. In his address at Gettysburg, Lincoln described a new future for a nation that would be reunited. It is for us the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work for which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, Gettysburg National Military Park was established in 1895, 32 years after the deadly battle. Gettysburg is the most visited of the Civil War battlefields. Every year, about 2 million people visit the park from around the country and the world. The battlefield covers more than 2,400 hectares. Visitors can find more than 1,300 outdoor sculptures around the battlefield. These are monuments and memorials placed by soldiers' groups and state militias in areas where their troops fought. Volunteer guides explain to visitors what happened in each area of the huge battlefield. Visitors can also tour the battlefields on their own, by foot, by car, or by bicycle. Many visitors start their visit to Gettysburg at the Gettysburg Museum of the Civil War. The museum has the world's largest collection of Civil War objects. The museum has more than one million items, from soldiers' private notebooks and uniforms to original maps of the battlefield. The museum also houses the Gettysburg Cyclorama painting. This kind of artwork surrounds the people looking at it. The painting shows the final attack in the Battle of Gettysburg, Pickett's Charge. George Pickett was a Confederate general. On July 3, 1863, he led a charge against stronger Union forces. It was a disaster for the Confederate soldiers. French artist Paul Philippoteau 
and a team of 20 artists created the painting in the 1880s. Philippe Tau and his team visited the battlefield. It took more than one year for the huge painting to be completed. The cyclorama is 114 meters long and almost 13 meters tall. It has long been one of the most popular parts of the Gettysburg experience. But by the 1990s, the painting was in poor condition. Experts warned that if the cyclorama was not repaired, the painting could be lost. A restoration project began in 2003. The painting was cleaned and separated into its 14 parts, and later moved into the new center. There, the original canvas was sewn onto new cloth made in China. Park Service officials say China was one of the few countries able to produce cloth in the sizes needed. Then each part was hung and sewn together. A team of cyclorama experts from Poland worked on the project in Gettysburg. The repair work of the Gettysburg cyclorama marked one of the largest art conservation efforts ever in North America. After the museum, tourists can visit the Soldiers National Cemetery where many of the Union soldiers who died during the Battle of Gettysburg are buried. The cemetery was dedicated on November 19, 1863, the same day President Lincoln gave his Gettysburg Address. Since 1865, the cemetery has been a burial ground for soldiers from all of America's wars. Gettysburg brings history to life during the summer and fall with its living historians. These actors and experts show visitors what life was like for a soldier here in one of the most historically important places in America. The words of America's 16th president from the Gettysburg battlefield have never been forgotten. Historians agree that Lincoln's Gettysburg Address defined Americans as a people who believed in freedom, democracy, and equality. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Katie Weaver. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.